In today's podcast, we will discuss Lewis Hamilton winning his fifth world championship, how Ferrari got both cars onto the podium, and how Red Bull ended up winning the Mexican Grand Prix. And we'll also take a look at the midfield as well. So here we are guys for the post Mexican Grand Prix podcast and as always I'm here with Niblo to go through this race. How are you doing mate after that? I think for you quite a sad end to that Grand Prix. Yeah I'm certainly still not over it but uh, we'll, we'll get on to that a little bit later in the podcast. Yeah we certainly will but we're going to start off with Mercedes and I think most importantly Lewis Hamilton who tapes his fifth world championship but... I think for Mercedes, their race was not really that good. And I think they came out and said that even though Hamilton won the title, Mercedes had probably their worst race of 2018. And I would have to agree. Their tyre wear was very bad. They didn't really have any race pace to actually compete with Red Bull and Ferrari over the entire race. And deservedly finished in 4th and 5th. And it probably should have been. 5th and 6th if Ricardo uh, had finished on the podium, which he deserved to. So, a very poor race, I think, for Mercedes compared to what they've been doing in the last few. But, Nib, for Lewis Hamilton, he is now a five-time world champion. What do you think of this achievement for him? And where does he rank for you now amongst the all-time greats? Yeah, the fifth world championship for Lewis Hamilton was secured yesterday morning for me, and he thoroughly, thoroughly deserves it. He's been the best driver all year, the class of the field, as we are so used to saying right now. But definitely for Mercedes, it was absolutely their worst weekend of the season. In the end, Hamilton finished 78 seconds off the sap off of the stap, and he nearly got lapped like Bottas did. Um, and they were running their updated wheel hub things t- so that t- the rear tyres could be better managed during the race, but that still didn't seem to work. But an interesting point that you did bring up during uh, the race reaction was that the Mercedes has a trait of having poor tyre wear, but it's, it's not really a trait of a James Allison car. Usually a James Allison car, as we know from his Lotus days, was very good on his tyres. So maybe that's something that he can bring to the table next season with the Mercedes car and hopefully have a little bit of better tyre wear for them because next year, if we do get these tyres, which degrade a little bit more, Mercedes could potentially be in trouble next season. Yeah, with um with James Allison, I do agree because yeah, in his Lotus days, the Lotus was very good on its tires. Even when he was at Ferrari, only a couple of years ago, you know the Ferrari was very good on its tires, and I think Ferrari still have um that trait from James Allison. So yeah, it's a bit of a surprise, but I I would have thought that he would have had an effect on that by now because he would have had you know, a proper, you know, an idea or a design for this 2018 car. So I would have thought that he would have tried to, you know, design the car better in terms of handling its tyres. But it just seems as though, again, this is a trait of the Mercedes car and it's most likely, you know, never going to go away. Well, as I got sidetracked there by one of my thoughts, I, I forgot to answer your question about Lewis Hamilton and where does he rank great. For me, he's now, without a doubt, in the top five of all time, behind Senna, Schumacher, Fangio, and, I don't know, potentially louder. But but for me, he definitely is fourth on my list of the all-time greats. It, he, he, I'm, not, I'm no fan of Lewis Hamilton at all. I really do not like him um, whatsoever. But... I have a tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for him. He is an absolute champion and he deserves to be a five-time world champion. Now we'll go on to Ferrari. Now Ferrari, I thought, had very good race pace, only really after their first pit stop for both uh, Vettel and Kimi Raikkonen. Vettel in the first stint wasn't really going anywhere and I think he said, or Kimi Raikkonen said, that they were just trying to manage their tyres in the first stint and then after... 
they pitted quite late after, you know, Red Bull Mercedes pitted their cars. They started to come alive, especially with Sebastian Vettel brilliantly passing Ricardo and Hamilton. For me, was driver of the day Sebastian, but just did not have enough pace, I guess, to go after Max Verstappen to win the race. For Kimi Raikkonen, he didn't deserve to go on the podium. His race pace wasn't too bad after his first pit stop, but yeah, definitely did not deserve for me to get a podium nib. A good race from Ferrari, but I get the feeling as as if if they had a good qualifying, say if they qualified in third and fifth where Mercedes did, maybe they would have gone with Vettel, you know, more for a race win. Yeah, absolutely. The qualifying did hurt Ferrari in the race, but I must say, I think Sebastian Vettel, if if the start was a little bit more normal than what it usually is, I think he could have been first into turn one. He got boxed in behind um, Max Hamilton and then got boxed in by Ricardo next to him, so he had nowhere to go. I honestly think he could have been first into turn one if that was not the case. But, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Sebastian Vettel was driver of the day for me. His race pace was really, really good, getting past Ricardo and Hamilton. He His overtakes were clinical, you know, None of this crashing into people, which everyone loves to talk about. So, yeah, he, he did a great job this weekend, in my opinion. Well, certainly in the race, maybe not this weekend. But as usual, Kimi Raikkonen was very anonymous during the race. And, yeah, certainly, certainly didn't deserve to be on the podium. Now we'll go on to the race-winning team, Red Bull. And with Max Verstappen, even though... He didn't produce, you know, the goods when it came to qualifying to get pole position and be the youngest pole sitter. You have to say, in terms of the the weekend, he has been the best driver this weekend. He was fastest in practice one, practice two, practice three, Q2, and dominated the Grand Prix. And I think did deserve to win the race. And good to see him winning a Grand Prix again for the first time since Austria. But... Again, for Daniel Ricciardo, another reliability issue at the last podcast after the US Grand Prix. We pretty much, didn't we, Nib, uh, detailed the amount of issues he's had in the last 12 months. And we have another one for Daniel Ricciardo. It seems as though, though, this one is a Red Bull issue, not a Renault issue. I think it was the clutch on the car that broke. So I don't think we can really you know, blame Renault there, but again, more reliability issues, such a shame. Well, we'll start with Verstappen here. He was absolutely the best driver of the weekend, probably deserved pole and and deserved the race when he got a good, he got a great start, great start compared to Ricardo, who got the typical Australian Mark Webber, I'm 13th by turn one start. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I'm 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 absolutely just fed up. It doesn't matter if it's Renault or Red Bull. It's all the bloody same to me. Uh, it just it crushes me. It absolutely crushes me. And I can only wonder and imagine what it does to Daniel Ricciardo. He said after the race that he doesn't feel like showing up for the last two races, and I don't bloody blame him because. What's the point of showing up when you can't, but he can't finish a race? It's an absolute, absolute joke. It's the same issue that Verstappen had on Friday. And I, I don't know what to say. I, 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 I absolutely don't know what to say. I'm absolutely sick of it. And I hope that even though next season he won't be anywhere near the podium, well, at least we certainly think that, that he might be able to actually finish a bloody race. Right after that, guys, I think it's best we now go on to the midfield. And first off, McLaren, who with Stoffel Van Dorn had a great Grand Prix finishing in P8. That is, I would say, Van Dorn's best race of this season. I'm afraid, though, that's a bit too late because he deservedly will not be at McLaren uh, for 2019. So, yeah, bit of a shame. But, you know, when he's not under pressure now, it seems as though he's performing a bit more than he was before but again great race by him for Fernando Alonso though again this 
retirement basically describes his last f three or four seasons. Just, you know, the potential's there for a, a decent result in the midfield, and then it all goes tits up in five or six laps with a, a very uncommon, you know, thing to retire from. Damage, you know, lodged in his car from Esteban Ocon. So, shame for Alonso, but that's just the way his career has now panned out. I think since the start of the hybrid era in 2014. No real surprise there. Niv, what do you have to say about McLaren? And for once, a good performance from Stoffel van Dorn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A great performance this weekend by, by the Stoffel. And it's great that we finally don't have to skip past McLaren like we usually do. It's actually something to talk about. An absolutely fantastic result by Stoffel van Dorn to get P8 and in my opinion, thoroughly deserved. He, he had a great race after a relatively poor qualifying result, as per usual, compared to Fernando. With a Fernando got 13th in qualifying, didn't he? Which I don't think any of us really expected McLaren to get out of Q1, and let alone you know get 13th on the grid. So it was a great lap by Fernando in qualifying, and then so very unfortunate with the debris getting stuck in the side pod causing him to retire. I mean, with the 30,000 Alonso masks that were there on Sunday in Mexico, um, I'm, I'm sure they were very upset that that he retired. And I, I feel for Stoffel, you know, all this pressure's been on him and then finally he delivered this weekend. And I still feel as if there is a driver there. There certainly is, but... He hasn't really been able to show it and that's that's at the end of the day costing me his job because if you don't perform, you get sacked and he, he quite rightly deserves to go from McLaren. Now we'll go on to Renault who were the best of the rest here in Mexico all weekend from the moment uh, practice one started. Renault looked very fast. I never thought they could maintain the pace from Friday where they were up in I think third and fourth or third and fifth. They were very, very quick on Friday, but I never thought they would maintain that pace. In qualifying, they did the best they can, a fourth row start. And I think they did the best they can, excluding, of course, uh, Science's reliability problem. I think they did the best they can pace-wise in the race with Hulkenberg finishing in P6. Uh, Nib again, surely this result, like the result in Kota, gives you more optimism going towards 2019 that Renault are actually making progress again and might be pulling clear of the midfield maybe for 2019. Yes, definitely another very positive weekend for Renault. Obviously, the altitude situation at Mexico helps Renault gain the engine deficit back up to the likes of Ferrari and Mercedes, well, those who are running those engines. So, yeah, a great weekend for Renault. They were incredible. And I, I so, don't say that lightly. They were incredible on Friday. They looked absolutely brilliant. They looked like they had the race pace of Ferrari and Mercedes, but that never, of course, come to fruition. And with Carlos Sainz, a very unfortunate retirement. He's having a great race. And it looks like it was a very similar issue to which Daniel Ricciardo suffered at the American Grand Prix where the car just completely shut off so very disappointing for Carlos Sainz but once again great by Nico Hülkenberg to get P6 in the end probably should be P7 for obvious reasons um, but yeah very good weekend for Renault and I think this all but finishes any possibility of them not getting four in the Constructors' Championship. Now we go on to the Pink Panthers Force India, who I thought coming into the weekend would be maybe not the fastest team, but say at least, you know, where Sauber were in qualifying, which was ninth and 10th, but they didn't have the pace in qualifying, even though they did not try to get into uh, Q3 in the race. They should have got a strong points finish, but they, they just couldn't get it. Sergio Perez... Ran a great strategy with uh, the team, you know, starting on super soft tyres, when as long as possible the virtual safety car came out for Carlos Sainz's car. Perez then pitted, lost less time in pitting, 
passed a couple cars, and then got up into, I think at the time, P8, and that would, that wa uh, that would, sorry, become P7 later on, if he had stayed in the race after Ricardo retired, so, such a shame for Perez having that brake failure, that was going to be probably his best home race result of his career so far, for Ocon, very scruffy, definitely could have done better, I think, Esteban Ocon in the Grand Prix to get a points finish, Nib, what did you think? Oh, su such a disappointment for Sergio Perez. He had such... It looked like it was going to be such a great result for him. And then, sadly, what actually was the issue in the end? I, I can't quite remember. I think it was a brake failure. I think it was. I I'm not 100% sure, but from what I've heard, it was something to do with the brakes. I thought it was a rear puncture because the way he was falling off the track, he was almost spinning. And normally, when it comes to brake failures, either you go into the barrier... Or you just run off the track, but you don't, you know, your rear of your car doesn't try to come round all the time. So I thought it was a puncture, but I think it was a brake issue. No, oh, well, there you go. I, I'm, yeah, not not too sure what the issue actually was for Perez in the end. I'm sure the comments will let us know what what the problem was. But I must say, the support that Sergio Perez gets at Mexico reminds me of the support that Ayrton Senna got from the Brazilian crowd. They are, they are absolutely fantastic in Mexico. The amount of support that they give Sergio Perez, and really not only Sergio Perez, but the the support that they give all the drivers and the atmosphere that they create around the weekend is truly brilliant. It feels like a carnival atmosphere, and I can really, I can only really commend the Mexican um, supporters for that. But back on to Esteban Ocon. For me, his worst race in Formula One. You know, he's only a few seconds off of getting getting a point, but lots of contact with Esteban Ocon. You know, there was that moment where he pushed Gasly off the track. Well, I thought he certainly pushed pushed Gasly off the track. You know, contact with Hartley, contact on the first lap. Very, very scruffy indeed for Esteban Ocon and. Yeah, probably his worst race of his F1 career so far. Now, that might sound like a bold claim, and I thought that was quite a bold claim then, you saying Ocon, that was his worst race of his F1 career, but thinking about it, with how consistent he has been, you might be you might be correct. I think that might be Ocon's worst race, because again, he had a lot of contact. So yeah, I, I think I may have to agree with you on that. But we'll move on to Williams. Uh, they were slow, as usual. In the race, they weren't too far off the points. Uh, I, I don't really know what to talk about Williams. I don't know if you want to mention anything, Nib. No, they were they were anonymous, as usual, throughout the race. I, I can't remember them really being on the TV too much at all. Um, yeah, poor in qualifying, as per usual in the race as usual same old Williams really now we're going to Toro Rosso Pierre Gasly I thought was good scoring points from the back of the grid in P10 I I never really got to see him during the Grand Prix but if you notice if you go and watch the Grand Prix back he was just progressively climbing the field he did pit though very early on I don't know if it was for damage or not but he did pit early on with Hartley as well. Hartley pitted at the end of the first lap. Gasly pitted, I think, a couple of laps later. Um, so I don't know if that was strategical from Toro Rosso. I don't know. But in the end, it worked out as Pierre Gasly scored points. For Brendan Hartley, though, considering how good practice was, I'm afraid when it came to qualifying in the race, when it mattered, he just he didn't perform when it mattered kind of and that kind of describes his 2018 you know he at times you'll see a glimmer of hope that he can put in a great performance for an entire weekend but then he goes back to this where he's down in you know 14th and 15th place I don't know what you think Nib but I am disappointed with Brendan because I thought after his uh his race at Cota the potential was there to have a consistent fast and point scoring Mexican Grand Prix. 
Yeah, and it certainly looked that way after Friday and even Q1. But then on the only lap that he could do on fresh um, hypersofts, forget how many bloody names of tyres there are just then, and sadly made a mistake going into turn 12, going into the stadium section, which ultimately cost him any chance of getting into Q3. And then the race just went from bad to worse for Hartley. Had a massive lockup at turn one, as he said, which made him have to pit um, to get some to get new tyres, of course. Now, and this isn't the first time that Hartley's had a massive lockup at turn one. I remember at Australia he had a massive lockup at turn one. I think he might have even had a massive lockup at Bahrain. There's been a few few races where Hartley's had a massive up on the first first lap and it's really cost him so with Hartley very disappointing and then obviously he had that contact with Esteban Ocon later on in the race which he got a five second time penalty for which I personally thought was quite a harsh penalty uh, not sure about what you think about it but disappointing at the end of the day for Hartley and yeah Gasly I didn't really notice him at all during the race as well because there was a lot of action going on at the front. Um, but yeah, great drive by Gasly to get a point. Now we'll go on to Haas and what a awful race this was. Very similar to how they were in Monaco, just consistently at the back with teams like Williams and you could say McLaren as well. Just not good enough from Haas. I know... After the US Grand Prix where they disappointed and, you know, their chances of fourth coming into this race were basically dead anyway. They still had to go out fighting. And I said that in my preview coming into this weekend. They had to come in to this Grand Prix and just be aggressive and just try and fight to get points just in case they can put pressure on Renault. Maybe for the last race uh, in Abu Dhabi. But they were nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. In the race, their pace in the first stint wasn't too bad on super soft tyres, but I think Haas, I don't think their car was particularly quick. I just think they were benefiting from being on better tyres. Again, not because their car was quick. And then when they pitted for ultra soft tyres, they went nowhere. Absolutely nowhere and finished last of all the runners with Magnussen and Groge on nib. How bad was this for Haas? Again, I know they pretty much lost fourth after the US Grand Prix, but they're just down in the dumps, I guess. Yeah, it was a catastrophic weekend for Haas. This was absolutely awful. Qualifying reminded me of Monaco, Canada, Singapore, where they were, well, not Singapore with uh, Roman Grosjean, but Singapore with Kevin Magnussen, where they were just struggling and not able to turn the the softest compound of tyre on it. Once again, they had a good first stint in the race, I, I must admit. But once again, they couldn't turn on the ultra soft tyre. And they certainly need to fix this is issue because it's cost them a good amount of points this season. And yeah, that, I, can't, I can't remember too much of them on this being on the telly. They were quite anonymous, like quite a few teams were this race. And yeah, this season, the end of this season has been quite a disaster. You know, most people like to make that that, that pun. <laughs> but yeah, they've, they've kind of thrown away their chance to get instructors, I feel. And yeah, they, they, they just need to move on to, to 2019 now. And last of all is Sauber, who had a surprisingly good weekend, qualifying ninth and 10th with Leclerc and Ericsson, and scoring points with both cars. I did not see that coming, but as Marcus Ericsson said, the reason they went on to have a good race is because Ericsson, by holding up Perez and the two horses, I think, basically uh, sacrificed his race to ensure that Charles Leclerc ahead went on to score points and that he you know, could have a good points finish as well by holding Perez back as, as just as much as he could before Perez inevitably passed him uh, down into turn one. But for Salba, pace-wise, 
I did not see this coming. I thought they would be in there for, you know, for the last couple of points, but I didn't think they'd finish in P7 and P9. Very impressive. And Nib, we've been saying this for the last couple of races. They've been meaning to do this because they've had the pace at Suzuka and Kota to get a double points finish. And finally, they have gone and done that. A perfect weekend as far as I'm concerned by Sauber. Both car cars into Q3 with great performance by both Leclerc and Ericsson. Shout out Ericsson once again. And then great performance by both of the drivers once again in the race. You know, both drivers were brilliant this weekend. As Ericsson has said, and I agree with him, probably his best drive of his Formula 1 career. And he did a great, great job for Charles Leclerc, who comfortably finished in seventh because of Marcus Ericsson's great work to hold the, everyone up to let Leclerc build that gap and I, I still feel it's it's such a big shame that Ericsson is not going to be at Sauber next year I feel as if he has done more than enough to keep his seat you know we're thinking about potentially keeping Brendan Hartley and or Sir Guy Sorokin I think Sorokin deserves to stay but if you compare those two to Ericsson Ericsson has been by far the the better driver over both of them Obviously, different situations, but I still think he's been the better driver. And it's a real shame he's not going to be on the grid next year. I think Giovinazzi is, is kind of just because of how heavily involved Alfa Romeo are in the team. He's got the seat. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very disappointing for Ericsson. But once again, Charles Leclerc... <laughs> This kid's something special. He, he, he really is. And next year, it certainly is going to be great seeing go up against Sebastian Vettel. Right, before we go on to the questions, I just want to ask Nib, and I'll make uh, my point on this as well, on basically how exciting the Mexican Grand Prix was. I would give it uh, like a 6 or a 7 out of 10. It's definitely in the top 10 best races of the season so far for me. I wouldn't say top 5, but say, I don't know, between 7 and 10. It was a good race. And by the way, Pirelli, here is your evidence. If you bring soft enough tyres, you create good and exciting and close racing between the top teams and the midfield. Nib, did you did you like the tyre uh, situation this weekend? And what did you think overall, excitement-wise, of the 2018 Mexican Grand Prix? Yeah, the tyre situation, once again, was perfect by Pirelli this weekend. Tyres which... Degraded. That was once again helped by the heat. I must stress of of the Mexican Grand Prix on the Sunday. But <laughs> my view of this race is obviously heavily swayed by Daniel Ricciardo. But up until that point, it was a great race. There was lots of battling between the the front of the field with Vettel with his overtakes on Hamilton and and um, Ricciardo, and then obviously Vettel. Hunting down Verstappen obviously didn't have quite didn't quite have the pace to do that, but yeah, there was a lot of battling going on, and Mexico notoriously is quite a hard place to overtake, and there seemed to be quite a bit of overtaking this this weekend. So that was good for me. I'd probably give it a six and a half out of ten. It wasn't wasn't the best race we've had. Certainly, when we come off the great race that we had at Cota. Um, but it certainly wasn't the worst. I, I know the Melbourne Grand Prix was certainly a lot worse than this. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty solid Grand Prix. Now, guys, we'll get on to the questions to end this podcast. And the first one, or three, I guess you could say, is from Lord No Telling. He has three, which is first, will Gasly out-qualify Max in 2019? No, I don't think he will. No disrespect to Gasly, but I don't think Pierre, talent-wise is quite on Max's level. I don't know what you think, Nib, but realistically, can Gasly really out-qualify Max? No, and I'm even going to go as far as saying I wouldn't be surprised if Max clean sweeps Gasly in terms of the whole year, in terms of qualifying performances. Max is that good at qualifying. We always thought Ricardo was a good qualifier and he's been absolutely shown up by Verstappen this year and to a certain extent last year, so I don't think Gasly will out-qualify Max in 2019 at all. 
Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, I, I think when it comes to Gasly versus Max, Gasly is a, I wouldn't say a better race driver, but he's better on race day than he is in qualifying, definitely when it comes uh, up against Max Verstappen. Then he also says or asks, will Charles Leclerc out-qualify Sebastian Vettel in 2019? I... Don't know. For me, right now, it's 50-50. We have to see how Leclerc starts the season. If he starts off like Lewis Hamilton did in 2007, then he could. He really could. But again, we'll have to see how he starts 2019. Nib, I wouldn't be surprised if you think that Leclerc can. I think Leclerc can out-qualify Vettel, but I also think Vettel can Leclerc. I think this will be one of the more tighter... Um, qualifying battles between the teams of the of next season. You know, Leclerc is a great qualifier, and Vettel can be at times. So this one will be interesting to see how it plays out. This whole situation will be interesting to see how it plays out next year. So yeah, at, at the moment, not really too sure, but we'll certainly find out more as we get closer to 2019. And the last one is, will Hulkenberg out-qualify Ricardo in 2019? I think, I don't know, maybe at 25% of the races. You know, there's 21 races next season, so I don't know, maybe five or six of the races in 2019, Hulkenberg will out-qualify Ricardo. But realistically, I think Ricardo is the faster driver, and I think Ricardo will uh, be the team leader for 2019, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Niffy went for a clean sweep for Danny Rick. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not going to go for a clean sweep with Danny Rick. I think Hulk and Ricardo every now and then. I don't think it's as straightforward as some people will think. You know, as much as people you know, would think, you know, oh, Danny Ricardo, Australian fan, you know, absolute blind eye. But no, I, I'm quite realistic when it comes to things like this. And I don't think Hulkenberg can... Oh, sorry. I don't think Ricardo can coin, clean sweep Hulkenberg in qualifying. Right, the next one is from Your Average Sim Racer, who asks, will McLaren be a podium contender in 2019? Um, if you're a McLaren fan, you might not want to hear this, but the closest they will be to a podium is when they're getting lapped next year. They're not going to be anywhere near a podium. The best they could hope for is, you know, say if, you know, we come to Monaco or Singapore, they can get up to P8 or P9, like they did with Van Dorn in Mexico. You know, Mexico's another race. Maybe they can have a good result there. But realistically, um, I, I don't see how McLaren will be anywhere near a podium. I don't see it at all. Nib, I think you're probably going to agree. How how did McLaren get anywhere near a podium that quickly? I don't know maybe Jensen Button and Fernando Alonso do a guest appearance at the podium like they did at Brazil. <laughs> I think the simple answer is no. Next question. Right, and the final one is from Ben McCarthy. He uh, asks, it's quite a long one, but I'll read it anyway. He says, hi, Kaz and Nib. I'm thoroughly enjoying these podcasts. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sorry for not tuning in for as much as I'd like to have done uh, for this weekend. But my question is, where does Lewis Hamilton rank amongst the F1 greats and British sportsmen as a whole? And then he goes on to also say that uh, he feels as though Lewis gets unfairly judged about the tax thing and, you know, the whole dress controversy. Um, when it comes to F1 greats, I've said plenty of, uh, said, sorry, plenty of times, I think he's now top four of all time. I'll go Senna first, Schumacher second, Fangio third, Hamilton fourth. When it comes to British sportsmen, that probably take a long time to think about because there's so many great sportsmen, uh, but definitely top 10, probably top five. But, you know, by the time his career is over, he's probably going to have more than five world championships with the way, you know, him and Mercedes are going. So... Yeah, I'd say top five of all time. When it comes to the whole tax thing and other controversies, you know, yeah, you may not like it. But personally, when it comes to what he does away from the track, I don't care. As long as he performs on the track, then, again, I don't care what he does away from the racetrack. It, if that's what he wants to do, then, yeah, 
Right guys, that is now it for this post-Mexican Grand Prix podcast. As ever, thank you guys for coming along and thank you guys for the growth this weekend. We're about uh, 1750 in terms of subscribers, I think, or maybe just below that. Thank you guys very much. We've gained about 200 subs in about three or four days. Again, thank you guys a lot. And we are now getting close to 2,000 subs. Cannot wait to hit that very, very soon. And as ever... Thank you to Niblo for moderating uh, this weekend in the chat during the live streams. I know it's a very hard job, so thank you very much. And thanks for appearing again on the podcast. As always, mate, it is, as ever, a absolute pleasure to be on this podcast with you. But anyway, guys, that has been it for this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Don't forget, guys, I'll be back on Thursday with part four of my classic F1 2012 season review. As well, don't forget to join our Discord, link below in the description, also with my Twitter and my website. Comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below what did you think about what we discussed in today's podcast. Please comment down below what you think about those topics and until next time, it's been me, Chazzer HD. goodbye.